Hey everybody! Halloween is here, and Nostalgia Trip is going to be a little different this month. The ghosts of the past continue to haunt us, but don't be scared. I'm here to be your guide, and you can trust me. The Five Days of Stranger series is a four-game point-and-click horror adventure series, also referred to as the Trilby series after its main character, or my personal favorite, the X Days of Sauerkraut series. If you've played the games before, you might also know it by a different name, but that's a spoiler. Created by Ben Yahtzee Croshaw of Zero Punctuation, this one-man indie project distributed as freeware through Yahtzee's website, with no floppy or disk to speak of, wouldn't normally be the sort of thing that qualified for Nostalgia Trip. Except, Five Days a Stranger was released in 2003, making it 15 years old. Oof, that might be the spookiest part. The plot of Five Days a Stranger, and the events that trigger a disastrous domino effect which echoes into the next three games, revolve around a man known only as Trilby, a gentleman thief character who breaks into the estate of a recently deceased Mark, only to shortly discover that he, along with a small cast of misfits, are all trapped inside. The phones are dead, the front door and windows are locked, the backyard is walled, and worse, one of them is a murderer. And it might be Trilby. Leaning heavily on some horror movie cliches, Five Days a Stranger also harnesses the inherently slow pace of the point-and-click genre to great effect in building an atmosphere of tension. While you are never under threat of losing because you missed a puzzle or failed to pick up an item, as in the Sierra Classics, you are in danger, and it feels it. Clunkiness becomes helplessness, masking the weakness of this genre. To some extent. From a gameplay perspective, Five Days operates how you'd expect it to. Most puzzles revolve around finding the right item in the house, possibly to combine it with another item in your inventory, while other puzzles are found in the dialogue system. Built with Chris Jones's Adventure Game Studio, Five Days won a variety of awards on release, those being Best Puzzles in an AGS Game for 2003, Best Gameplay in an AGS Game for 2003, Best AGS Dialogue Scripting for 2003, Best AGS Game Scripting for 2003, and Best Game Created with AGS for 2003. Woof. That said, Five Days isn't a perfect game by any stretch. Spooky, yes, and interesting for sure, but it suffers from a lot of familiar pitfalls. While a certain amount of clunkiness in an adventure game is forgivable, Five Days oversteps that line by a fair amount, and as in most horror, the characters are mostly tired and generic, accepting our protagonist and the residing evil itself. Unfortunately, neither of these problems ever go away, but they do fluctuate in severity. Five Days a Stranger can easily be played as a small, one to two hour standalone. The story of the manor opens, builds, and closes, though questions still remain, and if these questions are too burning for you to rest, there is, of course, the sequel. It's set in space. <laughs> what? <clears throat> Seven Days a Skeptic is an odd duck in a collection of odd ducks. Set in the far-flung future, your protagonist is Dr. Jonathan Somerset, ship psychiatrist aboard the Mephistopheles, a scout vessel that is about to bring aboard a curious payload, one that will affect the crew in ways even your good doctor is not prepared to handle. Thematically the strangest of the four games, Seven Days also panics me the worst. The Mephistopheles is a spaceship. If there were any hope of escaping the manor, there is even less hope of escaping the ship, and what has been unleashed cannot be put back. Soon, it will come for you, and you are sorely, sorely outmatched. A not insignificant amount of this game is timed. Where Five Days had one surprise event that was deadly if you didn't react quick enough, Seven Days uses that script with abandon, including both plot events and a larger problem. You are being chased. Past a certain point in the game, you can no longer move about the ship freely. The Welder, the game's antagonist, has a chance to emerge from any door, and the best you can do is fumble through the inventory to paralyze him for a moment and enable a temporary escape. Tense? Yes. Fun? No. Seven Days is almost as clunky as Five Days was, and this doesn't lend itself well to dealing with this mechanic more than once or twice. And if you can't figure out some of the incredibly obtuse, or I'll say it, tedious puzzles, you might be dealing with this for a long time. While Seven Days might be, in my opinion, the scariest of the four, it's not enjoyable without a guide, which is the worst thing an adventure game can be. Thankfully, Seven Days is both short and more or less unnecessary, so we can move on to the best game in the series, Trilby's Notes. Trilby's Notes, set four years after the events of the first game, sees Trilby a damaged man, haunted by the things that happened to him and the things he had to do, things that are not as behind him as he had hoped. Working under duress for a government agency dedicated to investigating the occult, 
Chobi seeks out the answers to questions left over from the manor incident, and discovers more about the supernatural ongoings than he would have ever hoped to. Chobi's notes plays via a text input interface, mixed with arrow key movement. This works within the frame story, Chobi writing a retrospective of the events that take place, and it helps Yahtzee's real strength, writing events, actions, and descriptions, shine through. But it is a large leap from the previous two games, and text adventures are not a genre that is easy to get the hang of quickly. Depending on whether you like the change or not, it can make or break this game. It can also result in Trilby writing pages upon pages of, I saw no reason to do that, or sadly, I wasn't close enough to pick up the item. Trilby's about as good a storyteller as the Prince of Persia, really. Wait, wait, wait. That's not how it happened. Now where was I? Trilby's notes is where the supernatural elements start to coalesce into something tangible, and where Trilby starts to fall apart. While the Clan Bronwyn Hotel is a lovely place, the world that Trilby sees in his hallucinations is not so. Puzzles thus revolve around moving back and forth, somewhat unwillingly, between the two worlds, medicating heavily in order to do so, something which can have unintended side effects. In addition, several puzzles have you thrust back in time, experiencing a small segment in the history of the Welder, and further back than that, even. It's an excellent use of show, don't tell, in a medium that is notoriously prone to telling. This is the most visually engaging of the four games, ironically, and the grotesque environments are further detailed in the writing. Trilby's Notes executes its story with the right amount of answered and unanswered questions, and the twists are just right. It also features possibly my favorite puzzle solution of all adventure games in the final puzzle of the game. It's not without its failings, of course, like the rest of the games. As for puzzles, some of them occur in dialogue, which operates a bit differently than the other games. You have the option now to talk to characters about specific things, in the form of Talk to X about Y. This is far more interesting and organic, but it isn't always easy to figure out what will give a response and what won't, or what you're supposed to ask to progress which makes the barrier to entry even higher. There's also a heavy amount of walking, something which can't be made faster, and the characters that aren't Trilby or the villain are as uninteresting as ever, especially the awkwardly enforced love interest. Still, it is my personal favorite, and exemplifies the best parts of both the series as a whole and the overarching plot that binds the games together. The closing game of the series is Six Days of Sacrifice. Set some distance in the future, but not quite as far as seven days, a cult operates in secret to unleash the evils of the Dark World upon our world, and our unsuspecting new protagonist Theodore is pushed headlong into that world of suffering. Six Days aims to wrap up every loose end, and to explain what the previous games left behind. Both visually and mechanically, it benefits from the culmination of improvements from game to game. The interface has returned to a point-and-click style identical to Seven Days, making it easier to pick up than Trilby's notes, and the mechanic of being chased also returns, with less punishing results. Six Days, however, suffers some new mistakes. While the puzzles are overall inoffensive, and it's almost possible to care about one or two of the characters, the walk speed problem has become even worse with the advent of a protagonist with a broken leg. Worse, however, is the fact that in trying to provide all the answers to the questions of the past three games, the mystery disappears. And the plot that it leaves in its wake is, well, sort of dumb. Six Days is a game that, while serviceable from a visual and mechanical standpoint, is simply not scary. The few twists that aren't dumb are simply uninteresting, and in this, the last game of a series, Six Days endeavors to make you care about a new protagonist in a way that is, simply put, unachievable, while at the same time lending a sort of pathetic, pitiful air to Trilby, our hero until now. Simply put, Six Days needed an editor. There are elements of a story here that are salvageable, and there are elements that should have been left on the cutting room floor long, long ago. Including Trilby's entire involvement, maybe. Six Days takes elements from previous games without care for what context they're seen in, and loses the thematic connections in the process. It's a critical misunderstanding of what made the series good and engaging. Which is a shame, because it certainly had some measure of potential, but as it is, I try to forget it exists. Still, there are moments even in Six Days that are unforgettable. And if you are expecting a happy ending, there's simply none to be had. What? You expect a vengeful spirit to be easy to get rid of? But hey, if it's a happy ending you want, how about a spin-off game? Trilby, The Art of Theft, is not an adventure game. 
Set two years before the events of Five Days a Stranger, the art of theft sees Trilby in his heyday, stealing from the rich and giving to, well, mostly himself, really. This is a stealth game, built from a modified AGS engine. Trilby must make his way through a level, avoiding guards and security cameras, while gathering a certain amount of loot, as well as oftentimes completing a secondary objective related to the plot, most of which is conveyed through notes, subtitles, or simple cutscenes. Art of Theft's core gameplay mechanic is the light level system. Essentially, there are three levels of light. Full light, half light, and no light. Guards and cameras will always see Trilby in full light, never see him in no light, and in the middle is half light, where Trilby will be seen unless he presses against a wall to hide, which turns off his movement. It's a neat little system, not particularly unique to the stealth genre, but unique when considering that this is derived from the adventure game studio engine. Most of the level design is then based on forcing you to time guard and camera patterns so you can move through brightly lit areas without tripping an alarm. You have a certain allowance of alarms in each level, usually around 3 or 4. A camera will trip an alarm almost immediately upon spotting you, with only a moment for you to leave its sight. But cameras also have a blind spot directly beneath them. Guards are much more forgiving. It takes longer for a guard to fully see you, and once they do, they waste valuable time fumbling for their radio. In this time, you can move in for the kill. Hello? <gasps> With the taser built into Trilby's Grawly, that is, Grappling Brawly, or Umbrella, you can save yourself an alarm at the expense of spending a taser allowance instead, which is usually equal to your alarm allowance. It's also just satisfying. These aren't strict rules, however. After each heist, you're graded based on your performance, and then given a reward of reputation points accordingly. You can then spend these on upgrades, each of which gives you some sort of boon which either makes heists easier, or allows you access to previously blocked areas, which can in turn make the heist easier anyway. Generally, the more powerful the upgrade, the more it costs, and there are some pretty cool ones in there. The downside, however, is that there aren't enough reputation points available to earn all the upgrades. The way the system works is, say on your first run through the heist, you earn 100 rep. Then, on the second run, you do a little bit better, and earn 120 rep. You don't actually get 120 rep. You get 20 rep, because you only perform 20 points better than last time. With each heist having a limited amount of rep available, you can easily hit the cap. This has the effect of making it difficult to grind out extra rep for upgrades, which might normally make the game easier. So, if you're like me, and find a heist that you absolutely can't get past without some extra upgrades to help you out, and have already spent all your accumulated rep on the wrong things, you could very well end up having to restart the whole game. And this game isn't easy. There are only seven levels, not counting the marathon bonus level, and each one has a part time of less than six minutes, but it's very easy to get stuck on a level for upwards of an hour. This isn't entirely because of the level design or intended difficulty either. Rather, most of my issues come from the controls. The downside to these really nice sprite animations is that Trilby controls like sludge. Turning around takes time, crouching takes time, pressing against a wall takes time, and sometimes this isn't time that you have. Additionally, the AGS engine doesn't like it when you give it multiple inputs at the same time, so if you're walking left and decide to crouch, you have to let go of left first or Trilby just won't do it. Other oddities, like the fact that Trilby will always stand up after a roll even if you are still holding down, can result in very awkward, sometimes extremely punishing movements. More than anything else, the controls are what make this feel like a bad game. It's creative, the plot is pretty alright, and it looks nice despite its age, with upgrades and unlockable outfits a good incentive to keep playing and get better. And of course, it's free. But once you're actually at the reins and not just looking at it, it's miserable. It's the sort of game I want to like, and might even say that I like, but I don't actually want to play it, ever. Add this to the fact that much better games of this style have arisen since, and Art of Theft sadly becomes a museum piece. Looks good, but god, don't touch it. Overall, this whole series has its ups and downs, its good games and its bad games, and while some, like Five Days and Trilby's Notes, are definitely still worth a quick playthrough, there's a fair bit of garbage in there that makes it hard to recommend the series as a whole. Still, I can't shake the nostalgia that I have for the games and their lore, and hey, there are still some Let's Plays out there, you know. So go spook up your Halloween with some scary games. And hey, when you end up feeling scared and alone, maybe join the Nostalgia Trip Discord. It is the best place to be notified when a new video of mine goes up, and don't worry, I'm not gonna at you. And hey, over a hundred of you are subscribed to the channel now, which is crazy, so maybe I'll make some new buddies. Or just chill out and watch me make a fool of myself live in real time. Whatever floats your boat. Thanks everyone for watching. And hey, sweet dreams. <laughs> <laughs>